Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet, this is episode 106 of Registry Matters. Happy Saturday night. It's cold here in Georgia. Larry, how are you tonight from the land of enchantment? That's where you are, right? That is correct. It is just fantastic. It was 58 degrees here today. It was up that high, but it's just it, last night was like the worst. I ended up going up to Atlanta. Oh, I have a story to tell you. Do you know a particular person named Richard from up in New England who talks funny, talks about like Pac in the car? I've, I've, I've heard him speak, yes. He, uh, he was in town last night, so I drove up to Atlanta and had dinner with him. He is a, he's a very unique individual, I must say. He's a good guy. I like Richard a lot, but he's a, he's a very unique individual, and he talks funny. Well, he's used to, he's used to being by the harbor. Yeah, he's definitely something about some Haba and Pak and Kaz and whatnot. But he, uh, he deals in antiques, and uh, he has some very interesting stories to tell about antique things that he collects and, 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 and whatnot. So, yes, he's a nice guy. But, so, you know, we, again, here we are with another podcast like we did last week. We have a ginormous amount of content to cover, and we couldn't really figure out a whole lot to cut out. And so we're just going to dive right in, and we're going to, like, this is going to be, like, the this, this, this speed episode. And we are going to start with an episode, uh, excuse me, an article from the New York Times about Bill Cosby. He loses an appeal of his sexual assault conviction. Uh, do you, first of all, do you think he's going to try and, like, run this up the flagpole and try and get the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to, to hear it? Of course he will. You think, and... Then would you suspect that they will hear it or not? I and suspect I they will. The future. Really, you do? I suspect they will. Yes, I suspect they will. What is your uh, What is your beef with uh, what they're actually doing here, like with his appeal? Well, it, the the decision is uh, ninety four pages, and I did not read all of it. I'm particularly interested in only one part of the appeal, which is of the of the of the number of issues he raised, which there were a lot of them. And you have to go to about page 23 because otherwise they're summarizing testimony since he went to trial. So you have to go to you have to go deep into the opinion before you get to where my concerns are, which are Rule 404B, and we've talked about that on the podcast on on one or more episodes in the past. And that's the rule that allows for admission of prior bad acts, and it is very very dangerous and when when they can put your prior bad acts into the equation in the guilt or innocence phase now they always get to come in after you're convicted but when they can put in prior bad acts in the determination of whether you're guilty or innocent it's it's really really detrimental and the prior bad acts is is the other women alleging but they did they their statute of limitations had already passed and so they were able to i don't know if the right word is testify but something along those lines where they were stating what had happened in the past and they were using that not as evidence but as character evidence i guess well it's 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 actually not uh, for character evidence at all you can't uh, uh you can't let's say he had he had uh, uh a through h on appellate issues so however many that is uh, uh anybody that can count a Eight. through h uh I'm 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 only interested in issue A, and I shouldn't say only. I'm primarily interested in issue A, which is where the lower court permitted testimony from five women, uh, uh, who, as as well as purported admissions from uh, uh, appellate civil de- deposition concerning alleged uncharged misconduct, and uh, 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 more than 15 years old, in some cases. So that was that was where I focused on the uh, on the on the on the appeal. And they go through Rule 404B, which prohibits the evidence of a crime, wrong, or other act to prove a person's character in order to show that on a particular occasion the person acted in accordance with the character. So you can't use it for that. But however, prior bad evidence may be admissible for another purpose, such as proving motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, absence of mistake, or lack of accidents. Accident. If the probative value of the evidence outweighs its potential for unfair prejudice, which the judge has to weigh the probative value and and the uh, potential prejudicial uh, effect of this, and the the, uh, the the Commonwealth sought, I'm reading from the opinion on page 27, to demonstrate that appellant engaged in a pattern of non-consensual sexual acts with victims that were quite 
distinct from a typical sexual abuse pattern, so distinct, in fact, that they're all recognizable as the handiwork of the same perpetrator. And that's what they argued. And that's what prevailed and carried the day in terms of those uh, uh, non-victims being able to testify. So just just showing that he has a, a similar pattern, and I guess is that mo like modus operandi? Yes, that's that, one of that's okay. one of the things in the, in this. Uh, and it says when ruling, and this is on page twenty eight. When ruling on the admissibility of evidence under the common plan exception, the trial court must first examine the details and surrounding circumstances of each criminal incident to ensure that the evidence reveals criminal conduct which is distinctive and so nearly identical as to become the signature of the same perpetrator. Relevant to such a finding will be the habits or patterns of action or conduct undertaken by the perpetrator to commit crime as well as the time, place, and types of victims typically chosen by the perpetrator. This is a tough standard, but uh, they they allowed those uh, uh, to testify, and uh, that that sealed his uh, doom in terms of the first jury. He was he they they deadlocked, and, yeah, and, it was and, and, right. and, and they were, did not allow this testimony. Well, the second always when you get a second trial, the state has a better. It helps the state more than it helps the defense because the state figures out what they could have done better. And they certainly figured out that using 404B and getting that evidence in would probably help them. And they succeeded. I have no idea if the man's guilty. I have no idea whatsoever. All I know is that 404B makes it very difficult. If they succeed in getting a prior bad act in, it, it is very prejudicial to jurors. Right. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I was going to bring up that any mortal human, as far as, you know, finances go, you certainly, you know, you would exhaust your funds before the state does. And Bill Cosby could ostensibly out fund the government as far as challenges go. I, I assume he still has many millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in his bank to to file petition after petition and challenges and all that stuff that he can he can push back on them pretty damn hard. Well, we don't know that either. Uh, typically, the, the uh, people, when they've been disgraced. They've often lived high on the hog, and he may not have millions sure. of dollars. We'll find out. Uh, but but I did highlight several things in the uh, 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 in the opinion, the 94 pages. But I did not go through it in its entirety because this is the issue I focused on, and and uh, it 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 is uh, it, it's a biggie to me as far as uh, <laughs> when 404B evidence is, is admitted, you're 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 swimming swimming uphill after that. Just, just uh, you know, do, doing research live on the podcast. He was worth four hundred million dollars last year. So, well, he should. That's be a able couple to, bucks, man. He should be able to have some staying power. You would uh, think. He should, you would think. He, so, uh, do you want to? Yes. You want to talk about uh, this crazy governor in uh, Kentucky that decided to give voting rights back to one hundred forty thousand former felons? Yeah, just briefly that. Yeah, we got a uh, not we Kentucky has a new governor. They, uh, uh, if this is an example of where your vote counts, I think the election was decided by less than five thousand votes out of a millions cast, and and Governor Matt Bevin, who had succeeded in in uh, alienating everybody, even in his own party, was defeated in a in a in a really really conservative state by by a Democrat, and uh, the the Democratic governor has. Has began restoring the voting rights of thousands of people. Now, to Bevin's credit, uh, he did he did pardon and commute some sentences on the way out the door, hundreds of them, and he's taken a lot of criticism for that. So people can can see what happens when you use your powers of executive clemency. What an outcry he's created by! I think he he pardoned out right over a hundred, and then he commuted sentences of about three hundred people. Wow. Uh, I saw uh, um, I saw a friend of the show Guy Hamilton Smith. I saw him post a tweet that he registered for vote for the first time in however many years. So that's pretty awesome. Absolutely. But so so who you vote for and whether or not you vote does make a difference in terms of public policy. Yeah, they definitely have consequence. And I just I always feel that um, we we end up. Reg- Regardless of party, I don't care to get into that side of the discussion, but I'm for team blue, damn it, or I'm for team red, damn it, and be damned whatever they're voting for. The other team is bad, and I cannot see myself ever voting for them. Well, uh, I, we don't seem to, uh, I don't see that in this state to the extent that, that it's perceived in, in, in the nation's capital. We work quite collaboratively here with the, with the other side, and uh, you, you, it may be that way in some states, but. But here, there's there's a lot of bipartisan cooperation, looking for the common good. But uh, there, 
certainly in Washington, it seems like there's a lot of polarization. And uh, over at WHYY, uh, PA House adds mandatory minimums to high-profile justice reform bill. This is another uh, elections have consequences uh, situation, I believe, that the uh, uh, the the House of Representatives, or I'm sorry, the legislature there in Pennsylvania is adding a bunch of mandatory minimums to their roster of uh, on the crimes. What else is going on here? Well, it's a, it's a bipartisan uh, uh, reform bill, kind of like the first uh, step act at the federal level. This is a smaller group of legislators who have come together on a bipartisan basis to to do a major reform. And then it's being hijacked at the last moment of the process by Republicans who say that, oh, we've got to keep mandatory minimums. We've got to keep mandatory minimums. So this is just an example, again, of elections have consequences. So the, the bill will ultimately be watered down in order to get something through. And it it will be like first step was watered down, but it's better than nothing. But riddle uh, me this, Larry: why why do certain people say mandatory minimums are not criminal justice reform, especially in how it impacts people of color and people of limited economic means? Wouldn't that semi level the playing field? Like if you know if, if Harvey Weinstein, with all of his hundreds of millions of dollars, goes up for the same charge that some you know minimum wage employee goes for, they both can receive at least the minimum sentence. Well, that has been the argument that's been made. So doesn't that make it more fair than less fair? Uh, if you believe that there are uni- no unique circumstances in a particular charge where the mitigation would merit that the person not receive any prison time at all, if you believe everybody should go to prison, I mean, if you believe that, for example, like in the federal system where five years is the minimum, I do believe, for, for possession of images, if you believe that 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 all images are so evil that they merit five years in prison and that the age and the first time offender status and none of that stuff should matter. I suppose that would be one way of looking at it. But I thought that we believed that human beings could could be judged individually and on the merits of of the strength of their arguments in terms of what they deserved as an individual rather than having a a cash register approach to just putting it into a, a formula and saying this is your sentence. And then we would therefore not even need judges and just, um, I mean, judges don't necessarily determine the outcome. They're more or less referees for the two parties in the uh, in the jousting event. And then the jury determines whether it's guilty or innocent. So we don't even need judges if we go that route. That well, we don't. We, we, need, we need to listen to the previous podcast when the judge was talking about that very thing, when he said, hey, I, I didn't impose a sentence. I had no choice. Uh, so the more the more crimes we have mandatory minimums, the the less discretion we have, and, and it always tickles me because our very own people that in the advocacy cause they get mad when there's a light sentence imposed, and I said, well, I thought that that's what you were for was individual determination, like with the Stanford swimmer, they they there was all this hoopla, and even from our own side, well, he should have got forty years, no, he shouldn't have, he should have gotten exactly what he got, <laughs> because that's what right. the that's what the merits of that case. In view of every professional who was involved in it, including the law enforcement apparatus, that's what they recommended. The probation department recommended that. So, so, uh, but, but now that will not be a possibility because California enacted mandatory minimums, which is a step backwards. So, whether it's whether it's a red state or whether it's a blue state, it's the wrong policy. So, California is wrong, and the Republicans in the uh, state of Pennsylvania they are also wrong. I think in California, yeah. it was largely voter driven uh, from the high profile uh, 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 backlash from yeah. Trump and Turner. Yeah, that was a referendum to get rid of. That's Judge Persky, correct? Well, but I also think that the uh, mandatory minimums passed, but, but it may have been through, just through the assembly, but it was cer- certainly voter driven. Uh, but now that there's a mandatory minimum that goes with that crime and they, nobody can ever get what, what, what Turner received as a sentence again. Of course. Is that the system? working as far as it evolving in a forward I, don't, I, 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 I totally don't believe the statement that I'm going to make but is that the system correcting itself that we saw this thing happen and then the the voters didn't like it so they demanded that the legislature change it so then the legislature responds well it is a system working but it wasn't the system working the way it, 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 that it ought to work because the the mob rule is what carried the day rather than well-reasoned thoughtful deliberation 
Is it the the legislature's role to then push back on the mob and not do what they're demanding? Well, to some degree, yes. That's why the system was staggered with uh, why senators typically serve longer. They're supposed to be able to withstand the mob because, like in the federal system, they only have to face the wrath every six years. And originally, as the Constitution was designed, they never had to face the voters that were selected by their states. But uh, senators typically serve longer periods of time. The system's designed to not respond to mob rule. But unfortunately, that design has largely given way because of the perpetual life cycle that something has. In yesteryear, you didn't you didn't have these stories as likely to come back and haunt you as you have now the 24-hour news cycle with continuous replay of everything that someone does. Uh, I, was, well, I think we were talking about that uh, orphan's uh, uh, children's home in, in yes. uh, Memphis back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, about the, the woman who uh, was supposedly helping kids and she was killing them and selling them on the black baby uh, uh, black market. Uh, we did cut it from the show, but yeah, we were talking we, about we, it. We did, we did cut that from the show, but in that era, in the 1920s, radio was just beginning. Basically, your media was newspapers and, 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 and published magazines that went through slowly through the U.S. mail system. And you wouldn't have known much about that outside of Memphis if you didn't, if you didn't receive a national magazine. And if you, if you didn't live near Memphis, you would never have known about that horrible thing where all those dozens, and I think, I uh, forgot to count, but it was a large number of kids that were that were sold in the black market and, and dozens more killed and buried there on the, you wouldn't have known about that. And in this day and age now with, 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 with the continuous life cycle, everything that happens is recorded digitally, be able to be resurrected and any move of politicians, uh, uh, and they prefer to be called public servants, but any, any move that, that a, a step that a, uh, that a, public servant engages in is subject to constant ridicule and criticism later. They resurrect your words, and they play them back to you. They take them out of context, and they vilify you with them. That wasn't possible in the 1920s. It wasn't possible in the colonial times. It wasn't possible to just very recently to do this. In my lifetime, and I, and I, it wasn't possible. I, and I and I think of a person like you that just has this archive of knowledge. And and most you know all of us have some sort of like hobby where we just know an exorbitant amount of just bullshit, nothing data, but you just have all this historical knowledge about every politician that's ever been anywhere in the United States for the last hundred years. And you pull the secretary of state from 1970 or something out. And well, I remember such and such happened and like nobody else would remember that. But now all of us have the ability to type in person's name into Google and we can hear all of the dirt that goes back all of time. And they can continuously replay the loop on, on, on the hit pieces that they run or in the hit mail that they run, they'll take, they'll, they'll make a gray photograph, make you look as sinister as possible. Yeah. And they'll put Senator so and so voted no on such and such. And, 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 and it uh, voted like for, for the, for the, uh, against the mandatory minimum. Say, for example, a California lawmaker had dared to vote against that. Right. They would be vilified in perpetuity for not being for victims. They'd be, they'd be anti victim and pro-criminal. And you'd have a very short-lived political career after that. Definitely. Um, Over at the Post-Gazette, sex offender registry law and PA facing life or death test at Supreme Court. This is all about Megan's Law 1, 2, 3 and all of their different iterations of which one's going to pass. There's one paragraph that is super interesting to me that we covered in the pre-show. I have to find where it is. Where can you can you find that real quick? Where the the politician said that we will go back to the drawing board if they strike it down. I don't remember I where can, that was. Yeah, it was it was toward the end. But yes, uh, uh, and I tell people to take these people at their word. This was another example of consequences. This was Representative Rob Kaufman, a Republican from Franklin County, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee. Now that's a key committee. Because judiciary is typically where registration of sex offenders legislation has to clear in all legislatures around the country. They'll have something called a judiciary committee in each, in each side of the rotunda. Uh, and, and he has said that if the courts uh, hand us a decision that guts Megan's law and the effectiveness of Megan's law, I believe the legislature as a whole will be prepared to act to reinstate it in a manner that would respond to the court's opinion, he said. So he's telling you straight out that even though they gutted it in Munez and said you can't do it, 
and they reincarnated it, and this is the reincarnated version, he said, I'm going to do it again if they got this one. So we're going to be in a perpetual battle. And I remember I had a person in Pennsylvania when I did a conference call after the Munez decision came out that was just so shocked that I said that the Commonwealth will fight this. They will do everything they can to preserve registration. And they did. They, they tried to take it to the U.S. Supreme Court and they were denied. And they, I said they will try to react and reenact another version. They did. And they are telling you now, this is not me saying it, so you can discount that I'm a kook, but this is a key leader of the legislature saying, this is what we're going to do. If you don't want this done, I would suggest the people of Pennsylvania, particularly in Franklin County, don't reelect Rob Kaufman. That would be a fairly easy uh, solution to that problem, wouldn't it? Well, it, it, well, if 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 the if the Republicans continue to have the majority, that, that Pennsylvania is under split rule. They have a Democratic governor with Tom Wolf, and then they have overwhelming majorities in the Republican uh, co- controlling both houses of the legislature. So there's absolutely nothing Wolf can do other than veto anything they would enact. Now, how long would Wolf's career be if he were to veto yeah, sure. or reincarnate? <laughs> yeah, so here's, 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 here's the provision that's going to keep the sex offenders under watch, and he says, no, I'm not doing this. And yeah, talk about mob rule. They're going to go after him with pitchforks and torches. So, yeah. so he, he will have no choice but to sign it. And if he did veto it, his veto would be overridden because whatever minuscule number of Democrats they are, they would vote with the Republicans to override him. And uh, so, so it would be a short-lived veto. Uh, but but one way you can stop this is to make sure that people who are in key positions understand the issues. And it, it appears that Kaufman doesn't. So if he's unbeatable, and I don't know, he may be winning his elections by 60, 62, 65 percent. He may even be going unopposed. I haven't done that level of research. But if if that's the case, then then folks who live in PA need to be making sure he understands that the registry has many flaws. And he even said that. He said it may not be perfect, but it's a vital safety tool. And can you dig into that for just a minute about, um, you know, doing the research behind the politician about is he vulnerable, anything like that? Can you can you dig into that a little bit? Well, it, if if the person if the person is winning, for example, overwhelmingly or if he has no opposition, he has political capital to burn. So if you were to be able to reason with him to get him to understand that the versions of, of sex offender registration they have are not really the best way to go about this. They're not going to go to no Megan's Law, no registration at all, because if they did that, the U-Haul business would be so good that Pennsylvania would be swarming with, with people coming there. So if they had no sex offender registry. So if you go to, to Kaufman with that as your wish list, he, he's going to say no. But if he has enough political capital to burn, he I think we've talked about credibility of who who has the moral authority to do something. He apparently is a law and order, tough on crime person. So if he were to come in and say, yes, I'm sold on a, on a, on a scaled down version of Megan's law, no one is going to question him because he has the credentials. He, he has both the political capital to burn if he's winning by a large margin or having no opposition. And he has the credibility on the issue because he's the law enforcement apparatus. He's exactly who you need to try to scale this back. If you bring in a liberal do-gooder, they just vilified them as being soft on crime like they did Obama. So you need a law and order type to give you the, the leverage to do to do something as creative as scaling back the registry. Interesting. That seems... Uh... It's counterintuitive. <sighs> No, you need- to, to me, honestly, that one, that particular issue is not the person who would be naturally opposed to it. To me, that totally makes sense that you would want the person naturally opposed to the issue to bring the issue to the table because it just it, it's not a conflict of interest, I suppose you could say. Well, well, they they would never question their 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 integrity. See, it's easy to question a liberal do gooder like Obama who wants to back off on crime. But if you take someone who's hard nosed like Jeff Sessions, if he were to get like the president and say, we've gone too far on crime, nobody would ever question Sessions because he has the credentials of having been tough on crime all of his life. He's locked him up his entire life. It's like Nixon opening China in 72. If, 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 if Humphrey had gotten elected president and was running for re-election in 72, and he had made an outreach to China, Humphrey ran in 68, just in case, case for the youngsters that don't realize that, and he lost a close one to Nixon. If Humphrey had won that election 
and he had made an overture to China, Nixon and the conservatives would have vilified him and saying that he was compromising national security. But when you make your life career like Nixon did, ferreting out communists and being Mr. Security, he had the credentials to open. He had nobody would question his commitment to 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 to, to our nation's security. So 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 he was able to shake hands with Joe and Lai, and nobody said a thing. Okay. So, and Brezhnev so and all those all the he he was able to do détente in case those have forgotten yeah. that that détente and and also the 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 ultimately the recognition of China happened under Carter, but Nixon opened the door. And and he, so so a law enforcement type is exactly who you need to scale the registry back. And so ultimately, the only thing that Pennsylvania could expect is that Megan's two won't be reinstated as the law of the land. Some revision of May, Megan's three would then be stood back up or stood up. Well. Uh, I'm confused because they have so many versions, but the, the race. They're, they're, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Their their most recent iteration, an attempt to to uh, reinstate what they perceived as the damage done by the Menez decision. This was the legislature trying to salvage, and according to all observers in Pennsylvania, they basically reinstated the previous law, most of it that was that had been declared unconstitutional. Well, they're likely to do that again, uh, and. and that that's what I'm saying. If if you if you have any hope, you need to reach out to the law enforcement people that they are in the legislature and say, look, we don't want to be a perpetual litigation because if you pass another version, it's as bad as this. We're going to be right back here again. Yeah. And yeah. and if you're as conservative as you say you are, and if you believe in fiscal responsibility as you say you do, and you believe in sound public policy as you claim, then let's come up with a public policy that's more cost efficient and actually promotes public safety rather than keeping the state embroiled in perpetual litigation that's consuming hundreds of thousands of dollars and countless, uh, I started to say man hours, can't say that, person hours. <laughs> and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a distraction because a true conservative would not want to be embroiled in perpetual litigation because they're the guardians of the purse, remember? I've heard that. I've heard yes. that, so I, I'm not sure I believe that that's actually a true position. Oh, well, uh, if you look at the federal ballooning deficit, I think we can clearly see it's not. <laughs> oh, I see. I wasn't trying. I wasn't trying to go there. I was just going to leave that hanging chat out there for anybody to go. What is he talking about? <sighs> <sighs> Let's move over to an article from Courthouse News. And I, I, I really love this picture. Please go to the show notes and check out this article from Courthouse News. It'll be the fourth or fifth article down. It says Weinstein off the grid dozens of times. Prosecutors tell court this picture shows this guy who's 67 years old. He's clearly overweight. He is not in any sort of physical shape to resist the two very large humans that are manhandling him down the walkway. He's not going anywhere. I don't know why they have to have their paws on him in such a way that like, you must come with me now. I don't like, he's probably just going to comply. I don't think he's going anywhere, man. Um, um, I've, but, I've always raised that, raised that question myself. I think it's a part of the humiliation. I, mean, I, I would agree. You know, this is a totally a perp walk. But I mean, if he were, and f forgive me, but the, you know, this is profiling. But if he were some, I, I don't know, let's call him an NFL player, you know, and he's 300 pounds just of solid muscle and runs a, a, a the 100 yard dash in 10 seconds or whatever would be fast. Okay, maybe you got to keep your hands on that guy. Um, but his uh, ankle monitor, because he lives in some obscure kind of neighborhood, there's no cell service where he is. So they, they, they're talking about that his, uh, GPS ankle monitor has been non-responsive 56 times or some stupid number like that. And they want to have his bond raised so that uh, they can keep a closer eye on him and make sure that he'll show up for uh, court. So, and, and we have covered GPS monitoring things a gajillion times. And here's a guy that has all of the money in the world and his stuff doesn't work either. And uh, they're trying to, to put the screws to him because his, his technical glitches of his GPS monitor thing isn't well, working. Well, the, so judge, well. the judge did raise his bail. I mean, he was able oh, to pay, it, but you know, the judge raised his bail and threatened that he could revoke his bail. And if I were Weinstein, I would disregard the advice of my attorneys who have who are probably telling him that we can save you. And I would say I am going to live in a place where there's not going to be any reception problems because I don't want to be I don't want to be remanded. And that's what they're going to do next is they're going to try to remand this man to custody. Oh, I'm so forgot. I'm not I, supposed to. I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna have a a, a party and live happily after ever. They're, they're not gonna try to remand him to custody. So we we should have a party. 
<laughs> well, no, but 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 clearly the the prosecution is gunning for re- bail revocation here, and I'm saying, look, I'm not supposed to say what I actually think is going to happen, so I'm, I'm retracting that. I'm saying that the, the that I misspoke, and the prosecution is just going to have a, a party for him. <laughs> but, um, but you know, he's 67 years old. He is he's alleged to have done a bunch of horrible things, and I think it says that he could get life in prison if he gets uh, convicted on all five felony charges. Yeah, faces life sentence if he gets convicted. Um, and we, are, do we still have in the United States innocent until proven guilty? Uh, we claim we do, but, uh, I'm dubious about it because we don't seem to respect that. And I, I mean, I guess a guy with like what I think his net worth is in the $60 million range. I, I mean, I guess he, he could be considered a flight risk. I, that is probably fair. And that's why you would give him some sort of large seven figure amount of bond money, right? Well, that's theoretically what the GPS monitoring is doing, is keep keeping tabs on him. Theoretically, if he goes off grid for too long a period of time, they would go out and find him, try to find him. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's crazy because they, I'm, I'm sure they've confiscated his passport. They've entered it into every system, so he would have to, he would have to figure out a way to travel uh, undetected, and he would have to figure out a way to get out of the country. Uh, I don't think and it's not like his face him. isn't on the cover of every newspaper. At least so, it has been right. So it has been, he would be easily recognizable. It'd be hard for him to right. evade. Hey, they would go get him wherever he went anyway. Yeah. All right. That's uh, over at the New York times, three Illinois prison guards face U S civil rights charges in inmates beating death. I have one question for you, Larry. This guy sustained multiple broken ribs a punctured colon and other serious injuries in the attack died six weeks later from blunt blunt trauma injuries. I'm pretty sure I know where the colon is. And that's sort of like uh, the final area on the back door side of things. I can't quite come up with in my head of how you would have a punctured colon. If not one thing had been done, I can only come up with one way to puncture a colon. And that's my only question of this. And I don't know any other way either, but it, 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 the feds are on the case with civil rights, uh, with, with filing charges against the, the police officers. I remember I always magically become a defense or any person. So even though the, the, the guards would never believe that anyone's innocent, it looks bad, but they are all, they too are to be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They're entitled to representation, to participate in their defense, to call witnesses on their behalf, to cross-examine the witnesses that are called against them, and they're entitled for that presumption to follow them through their duration of the proceedings until a jury of their peers returns a verdict of guilty by unanimous, except for in the state of Oregon, I think, uh, by, by a unanimous, uh, in the federal court, it'd be unanimous. So I'm not ready to presume them guilty, but it certainly, it certainly looks awfully bad. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, so as I recall, I'm not positive of this, but the Abu Grave where the people were uh, urinating on the uh, the detainees there, I want to say, as I recall, those were all pretty much junior enlisted people that were involved. Like it didn't. I, I think other people were aware of it, but they didn't. They weren't actually doing it. So here is the lieutenant and a sergeant, and then an officer. The lieutenant is kind of like the HMFIC of at least the shift. So like. A person all the way at the top of the level of the food chain there was involved in this individual being beaten. It's uh, allegedly. If, it, if the allegations are true, it's a sad commentary on our prison system. I mean, and, care, uh, this the is the care, place that uh, they're, the they're in charge of this guy, right? Yeah, the, the the safety providers and caregivers are are doing some dubious things. And also, uh, in the report, so again, I'm throwing these people under the bus without having them had their day in court, whatever. But the assault on Mr. Irvin occurred as the lieutenant sergeant officer moved him from his residential unit to, wait, I'm sorry, I missed, uh, did I get it? He, he, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The three men assaulted him without legal justification while he was handcuffed. The guy was handcuffed. He, he can't block anything. He can't cover himself up. He can't, and they, uh, anyway, so he posed no physical threat. I'm really bothered by these things, Larry, that these things happen. Well, uh, so am I. And and, uh, apparently the U.S. uh, Justice Department, the U.S. attorney in that jurisdiction was bothered enough to bring charges, which is a rarity. And the feds, as a general rule, don't bring charges unless there's a compelling case. So they feel like they've got a strong case. 
All right, then. And then uh, another one from the New York Times uh, says, landlords can be liable for racially harassed tenants. What, what does this have to do with anything? It only has to do with, I uh, think, uh, in recent episodes, I was trying to address why when landlords are choosing tenants or when employers are choosing uh, hirees of the potential liability and having been in the landlord business for a, a large number of, long number of years, I face this very thing where, where you have to keep an environment that's safe for everybody. And this is an example of what happens when you allow tenants to be running the asylum. So that was the only reason I put it in there that that uh, you can't you can't allow tenants to do what they apparently was going on here. And that that would be state by state, though, correct? And this article comes out of New York that landlords can be held liable. I you know let, let's call New York a pretty blue state, but move over to a state with a different political kind of ideology. Maybe landlords aren't responsible. Well, I think federal housing would be would be uh, you may. You may. You may end up having having issues with the feds, uh, but but to just think that people are not liable for for what other people do that's just that was the whole point is you can be liable when you hire people, you have a certain duty to screen who you're hiring and keeping a safe workplace, not just because you're being convicted of a sexual <laughs> offense on the registry that in and of itself doesn't make you a danger to the workplace, but it does raise a question just as any other conviction does about the safety of the workplace. Got it. All right, well then let's move on. Look, man, this is two weeks back to back with an article from Tech Dirt. And um, I'm just kind of amazed that we would end up with an article from a site called Tech Dirt. Another federal court says compelled production of fingerprints to unlock a phone does not violate the constitution. So the bottom line up front is if you have stuff on your phone that you don't want anybody to know about, you have to use a pin code and make it as long as possible. Don't use a fingerprint and don't use your face because they can totally cheat. And like, you know, you can get two guys, two people to hold your face down and hold your eyes open and they hold the phone up to your face and your phone unlocks and they could just totally get your finger and put it on the phone and unlock your phone. So use a digit and that would at least be more protected or by your fifth amendment protection of compelled speech. You did a you did a great job analyzing that uh, because yeah. that's exactly where the where it appears that the case law is heading. But this is a developing area of case law. We we really don't know how this is going to fully develop because we wouldn't have needed to think about this just a few short years ago. Correct. And and, and uh, we're we're dealing with with evolving technology, and it's very reasonable to take contrary positions. We've we've had. Decades, if not over a hundred years, of jurisprudence about identification and compelled identification is not it, 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 that when when they force you to give your fingerprints, that's not testimonial. It's just a simple identification. So so that doesn't violate any any part of the Constitution. When they force you to speak for voice analysis, that doesn't compel you to testify against yourself. When they compel you, Michael Jackson, to, to allow his genitals to be <laughs> photographed. That was not compelled speech. Uh, it, it wasn't testimonial in nature. They just simply wanted to see if what was described matched the description. And when they serve you with a search warrant to, 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 to search your house and they find all sorts of incriminating documents, those documents, you're not testifying against yourself. They're simply executing the order of the court to search the premises and they're coming up. So it is it is not unreasonable to have the position that some courts have taken on this is that opening your phone in and of itself is not testimonial. The, the, the thing that seems so very different in this regard is you have all of the myriad of tools that you could use to make a journal. Uh, you know, you could use a program like Evernote or whatever, and you are keeping, you are, you are transcribing thoughts into someplace and you're storing them in some sort of, you know, container. And then you store that on your phone. So you always have a, you know, quote unquote, a book that you can write down in your diary and you could confess all of your crimes and all of your sins in this little book. And to, to me, it feels like you should be able to protect that from everything and you can do some really crafty things to make it so that those people can't ever get into it. And I, 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 all of your financial records, all of your contact information, all the conversations you have with all the people is stored there on that device. And it just seems so invasive, invasive that 
in one fell swoop, they can grab that thing and have your entire, your, not your entire life history, but your, your recent handful, five, 10 years of history, just all in one fell swoop. Just boom, got it. What about people who uh, keep uh, very detailed uh, diary journals of, of their life and they record their uh, activities that are less than, than flattering? In their diary. Yeah. What happens to that? What about people who make videos of themselves going out and commit crime? Should they not be able to use a video against them? That's not testimonial. You're uh, not testifying I, against I, yourself. Yeah. And you're not being forced I, I mean, to testify that's... against yourself. You 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 were idiot enough to make a video of yourself committing a crime. <laughs> true, true that, true that. I, I just like, there's just so much other information in there outside of the one little focus of the 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 issue. It just it's a secure, it should be a secure, somehow you should be able to keep it secure. I, to me, that's what it feels like up to the point that there's some kind of search warrant, which I know this is where this whole article goes to is, is getting a legit search warrant, but the police and border guards are confiscating your gear and they can just plug in a device and they can snatch all your data and they then have, well, they have your data without necessarily going through the proper channels of getting a search warrant. Didn't the Supreme Court just rule that they can't do that anymore at the border, that they have to have uh, uh, They problems? did. They did just recently. And I, I was going to try and bring that up somewhere in here. Yes, they did mm. uh, just make it so that they, they can't, at least for citizens, they can't just arbitrarily say, oh, hey, you're coming back from Rome. Let's take your device and go get all the data off of it. So, uh, but but yes, the, 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 key, the key component here is whether it's testimonial and, and, and putting in your digits is not testifying. I mean, if you're a true textualist, <laughs> and that's what so many of our audience are, I don't know how you can say that that would be no different than handing the door key to the police officer who says, I've got a warrant, and slaps it in your face, and please open the door, we're going to use a battering ram. That is not testifying against yourself by unlocking the, the door. I don't see the, a huge difference. I yeah, wish I could I, say I, totally I did, but, yeah. but I don't. And, and uh, you know, I'm a strict textualist, right? <laughs> yes, I know you are. <laughs> Brian in chat says, one solution is to have the courts appoint a special investigator to look through the person's phone, looking narrowly for whatever is specified in the warrant, evidence of crimes against a confidential foreman in this case. But that is expensive. I love it. I think, I think he should join us on the next podcast. <laughs> and and a special investigator would be so this would be the quote unquote Robert Mueller so he's an sort of impartial just going through and then he makes a report says yes or no these are the things that I did or did not find end of story yep he should be he should be your uh, be your co-host with with me next week I, I I you've just replaced me thank you I appreciate it I said be be your co-host with me oh oh you've replaced yourself I see oh uh, yeah. Let's move over to an article from ProPublica, and this is why are cops around the world using this outlandish mind-reading tool? Larry, have you ever heard of a mind-reading tool actually working? Uh, polygraph. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So you want to you want to uh, <laughs> claim polygraphs are legit too? All right. Well, uh, I didn't say it. You said working. I didn't say legit. It works. It gets people to confess. So, so it doesn't read the mind, but it sure gets them to tell them what's in their mind, doesn't it? It does. It does. So. It totally does. This is somehow they, they hand you some Kabuki questionnaire with like uh, missing words and stuff in it and you fill it out. And then this special guy, specially trained individual looks at what you have written. And it says he noted while summarizing the day Hernandez disappeared, Joyner had not used the word I writing, for example, went home, not I went home. And somehow that is a signal of deception. This is complete kabuki. You think? I am pretty well convinced that that this, if you were to do a controlled study and have people write down their stuff and, you know, you get a control group of where people are actually going to lie and then some other group of people that don't tell lies and you wouldn't be able to determine anything whether, like, you know, somebody that doesn't have necessarily the highest command of the English language might not write, I went home. I do believe it's Kabuki myself. Yeah, I know you do. I know so. you're just like trolling me and trying to get me all riled up. Uh, well, it it's a pretty long article. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, where you say it works. I'm really baffled by the, the idea that the polygraph works because you believe it works. Therefore, you will then admit to your crime because you believe the thing works. But the thing didn't work. And if you stood your ground, you may have not had such the problems. But they, but they have the deck stacked against you. 
and that's that what is that the hobson's choice i believe the word we're looking for where, where which choice you make you it's like when you were when you when you didn't sink you were a witch and if you did sink or how did it go back in, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah so I'm with you but 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 the the they've got this stacked against you if you stand your ground in the polygraph and you say i don't know why your device is showing deception because i'm telling you the truth then they drop you from treatment yes which forms the violation so yep. the petition to revoke says participant was uncooperative in treatment therefore they were terminated to preserve a slot for someone else and therefore their failure to their failure to comply with court reported counseling and then they get revoked for that so you if you stand your ground you lose you get revoked because you're dropped from treatment and if you lie if you if you admit to your lie if if you were lying if you go ahead and confess then you get revoked for your admission so yep. there's th- th- so the deck is stacked you th- it's a windless situation for people when it comes to the polygraph there's a there's a streaming service i subscribe to called curiosity stream and it is a uh, sort of like a history channel and discovery channel kind of thing but what they used to be 20 ish years ago when they actually produced programs that were educational and they had a, a two part series about witches and the first episode in there, they profiled this young woman living in the town, and she's, I, I think she was a, a widow. And some rich dude comes into town, and he notices, and, and she, I think she's like her, his uh, like maid or something like that. And he notices that she sneaks out late at night. And he's now convinced that she's going out to perform witchcraft, when in reality, she was going out to have an affair. But in the 1700s, 1600s, you know, Salem's witch trial kind of thing, time frame. This kind of activity was not necessarily looked upon very favorably. So when he says, you're going out and performing witchcraft, she goes, no, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. And he's like, you're a witch. Admit you're a witch. And they start torturing the crap out of her. They put some sort of strap around her head and start tightening the screws, like compressing her skull. They had some things where they were like messing with her fingers and like terrible, terrible things. Eventually, after all this pain and duress, she goes, Yes, I'm a witch. And then they burn her. Well, it worked. It did. They got her to admit she was a witch. <laughs> well, I'd like to tell so, you, these, so here's these, the tool, these, these, these tools do work. They do something. I, it's more like duress <laughs> to me. This is some bullshit, man. This makes me so angry. If you put this under, like, you know, get, get like the Einsteins of the day and the scientists who actually do real science and get them to test these things, and they would be like, no. This is not real. But then we still use it because the police are like, oh, we're still going to use the thing. It's all your fault, Larry. All right. From Vice.com. What happened after Chicago police cut down on busting drug possession and prostitution? This is, hey, after they cut down on it, then they uh, probably needed some less police and they're a little pissed off that they need less police. Well, what, 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 to put it in the context, the, the police union in Chicago decided they were going to punish the citizens because they had the audacity to p- prosecute and convict and sentence an officer for Jason Van Dyke for, for, for killing Laquan McDonald. So furious at the police, at uh, the verdict, uh, they issued a veiled threat the day, the day asking whether citizens of sh- Chicago were ready to pay the price of police officers not feeling comfortable doing their jobs. And then they, they uh, uh, arrest by officers dropped 50 percent citywide the evening after the sentence and then came down almost 25 percent for the two weeks following because see they were teaching the citizens a lesson but the funny thing was when the police pulled back crime came down <laughs> now isn't that funny that is pretty so, amazing so now so they all quit and then crime didn't like skyrocket no so, no it, 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 so so in the weeks following Van Dyke sentencing serious crime continued to decline, even though the cops returned to a more active policing. So far, 2019, the number of homicides, which was previously one of the highest, has dropped by 8%. Murders have fallen to their lowest level in five years. Shootings are down 9% compared to last year. Police were doing less, but somehow Chicago became safer. Now, what I'd ask you, ask you people in Chicago, when the police come to you and tell you, we need that bond referendums because we need more officers on the street. Just because they tell you they need more officers on the street, that doesn't necessarily make it so. And oh. I, chast- I chastised our mayor at a public event here when he was running in 2017 because he said he wanted to hire 400 more officers. We were hovering around 850, and he said, we got to get the force back up to 1,200, where we'd been in the 90s. 
And I said, well, on what rubric do you measure that we need 1,200 officers? He said, well, that's how many we had in the 90s. I said, well, this wasn't the 90s. We have less crime now than we had in the 90s. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he says, well, that's just what the experts say. I said, who are the experts that are saying that? And, of course, that makes a, a candidate very uncomfortable. And he says, well, everybody knows that, you know, that, that Albuquerque's crime rate has been trending up and you know, we're trying to respond to it. And I said, well, is more police officers the only response? To a rising crime rate. I mean, is is that the only component that, that 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 gets more money to try to address crime? Well, anyway, I think the I think that this shows that more police because the Chicago police pulled back and crime went down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and not to derail what you were just saying, what other what other tools are there to to deal with a rising crime rate? Well, well, you you have the entire judicial system that that that, but but I tend to believe that that. Crime is a symptom of deeper social problems. Uh, there are some psychopaths out there that 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 probably that no amount of fixing would help. But I believe that a lot of crime is economically driven by despair and poverty from people who did not did not receive proper education, proper nurturing, and are not prepared to compete in a modern economy. And they see the seven dollar and twenty five cents an hour as being less attractive than than sustaining themselves on something that pays better. And it does pay better. There's a lot of criminality that pays better than $7.25 an hour. Yeah, I'm sure knocking but, over a grocery store or a convenience store probably pays better. And, and uh, so I believe that 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 in, in addition to to uh, a, a, a hiring forward of officers, that maybe you would hire 100 officers and maybe you would develop more early intervention programs to get teens off the streets more employment training programs for teenagers, more supportive work programs for teenagers to make sure that people that are in the, the formative years are getting the mentoring that they need. And hopefully they don't resort to a life of crime. We don't want people to choose that choose that life because it's a very expensive life for, for the taxpayers to support. So I, so I have some of that liberal do-good idealism left in me that I think that we can, that we can actually spend more money on prevention. And prevention doesn't just mean hiring more officers to go out and arrest people. Prevention means diverting people from a path of criminality towards a path of productivity and success. I think that sounds pretty amazing. Similar article over at The Appeal. Police play the victim when voters choose reform. I think this is sort of related to like the Larry Krasners of the world where they're going to like prosecute less crimes and whatnot. And the, the police are not really happy about having fewer uh, like fewer laws on the books that they have to prosecute thus possibly like reducing their numbers yes is that, that what's is, going on here that's what's going on here the police Bastards. gets get, get scared when 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 uh, when when you go when you go this direction uh and they scare they scare the voters and, and it works and don't we i mean like don't we want to live in a world where we actually like don't need police and if we don't need them like we live in a society that is you know to some degree some measure that it's safe that we don't have to have police running around think of mayberry where you just have sheriff andy and and barney whatever with his bullet in his pocket um that is ideal but uh we we <laughs> that's liberal thinking andy you know that, no. that's liberal thinking hang on hang on i got something my bad i got i just got slapped on the wrist so but in New York State, where landmark criminal justice, I'm reading from the article, reforms are set to go into effect on January 1st. A familiar course of concern has piped up, according to New York Times editorial board. Police Commissioner James O'Neill wrote in an op-ed in May that the law would, quote, have a significant negative impact on public safety. His successor, incoming Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, expressed similar views. No, uh, police unions and prosecutors across the state have issued ominous warnings. The Oneida City Police Benevolent Association wrote in a Facebook post, think this is wrong and insane. Then tell your politicians that this needs to be repealed ASAP. So this is what you're up against when you, when you, when you champion reform. The police- I love the title of that group, man. The Oneida City Police Benevolent Association? Really? <laughs> Well, that's hysterical. The, there's a lot of police officer benevolence associations, so that's that's not unique to really. To oh yeah, yeah. I've I've never I've never heard of that. I don't really consider that the police. Uh, I mean, may, maybe the majority of them are benevolent, but uh, we don't really cover the benevolence on this uh, ep on the show. You know, like the officers that beat the crap out of that dude and ruptured his colon somehow. So, so uh, but, but Attorney General U.S. Attorney General Barr 
uh, has uh, has has uh, has come down against uh, a lot of the reforms that are that are being done. So it's uh, it it's a scare tactic, and it works. I read somewhere recently that there are 13 Larry Krasners in the country. So like super progressive, like reducing the 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 prosecution load and all that stuff, and they are getting the crap beat out of them. Uh, you know, pu- uh, publicly and politically for their stances. And and in and, 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 and Krasner's case, they had the uh, the Pennsylvania Assembly uh, pass and bestow the prosecutorial powers that he was uh, decided he did not want to exercise to give those powers to the state so that those crimes can still be prosecuted. And I was talking to on a group of Pennsylvanians last uh, couple nights ago about uh, uh, how to legislatively be more successful. And I said, you know, this is this is the people who claim they believe in local control, but you let you let locals do something that they disagree with and see how quick they they zap that local control right away from them. Clearly. Yeah. I'm with. Yeah, that's it does seem to be a little bit of a, a conflict of position there. This is always uh, the, the funny URL to me. It's the CC Resource Center Collateral Consequences Resource Center. Model law proposes automatic expungement of non-conviction records. Can you give me an example or two of what a non-conviction record would be? Oh, there'd be there'd be anything from uh, the the jury returning a not guilty verdict to a prosecutor deciding that the uh, the evidence had had uh, fallen apart. If a witness dies, it's key to the uh, case. That could be. That could be a, a a prosecutor could file a notice of no late prosecute, but they're not going to move forward. It, you know, it could be uh, a motion to dismiss uh, for any number of reasons, like failure to comply with discovery, failure to to meet the time deadlines for witnesses, or for the you know you could the case could fall apart because of suppression of of of, of a motion to suppress a confession if that was key to the case uh, the, that could render the the case really not very strong beyond that so you could have any number of things that would would result in and and not a, con- a conviction or you could have a, an arrest where where an adult an indictment was never sought you could have where at the low level of the police officer in some states all it takes is a police affidavit of probable cause and a and a low level magistrate judge like in south carolina will issue a warrant when it makes it to the da's office they could just decide there's just not enough here and the the case doesn't go forward, but that person is stuck with an arrest record, and so so the, there's there's a, a, a considerable recognition finally that arrest records are so detrimental that we need to make arrest records that didn't result in a conviction invisible at some point. Should an employer, should a landlord, not have access to know that you were arrested? I mean, shouldn't they have the ability to see some sort of you know to get a, a picture of what your history is like? Uh, well, when I was a landlord, I would have said yes. Uh, and now I'm not so sure that I would be able to say yes because, A, I'd like to think I was just a tad more sophisticated than the average landlord. And I would like to think that I was a little bit more objective than the average landlord. And I think that the laws, the, 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 the type of charge a person could have been arrested for, the title could be so scary that even if it's a long number of years ago, I think it could be very intimidating to a person, and I think they, that they could rather be uh, rather be safe than sorry. They could say, "Nope, we're not going to have your kind around here." So I think, in hindsight, where I probably would have said, "Yes, the landlord should have access." I think at this point, I would say, "No, the landlord should not have access to arrest records that did not result in a conviction." Now, the law enforcement apparatus would argue just the opposite. They would say that there's all these hoops and stuff where criminals have manipulated the system. They've gone out and killed off witnesses that would have testified against them, and they've blackmailed people, and they've caused the cases to, to, to not move forward, and they're as guilty of sin as they know it, and that's why we don't want those type of, of, of arrests expunged. That's what they would say. And it still comes back down to we the people get to elect the sheriff, get to elect the uh, the lawmakers of what – you know what these the results of these things are. Well, it comes down to even a greater p- picture that uh, a problem than that, as far as I can see, is we all acknowledge that that arrest records and criminal convictions and even arrest records diminish a person's earning capacity dramatically for over the course of a lifetime. I guess it comes down to when you have your paw out when you reach the age where you need to have your paw out into the to the public trough. Do you want people earning seven dollars an hour? Or do you want people earning seventy-five thousand dollars a year? Which do you think would allow your paw to grab more? 
And oh, I, think I think you, I, I should be thrown under the bus as soon as possible, so I can just like <laughs> scrounge my whole way through the whole, you know, and that way I can I can just money grab the whole time. Well, well, but see, I don't think very many people look at it like that. They look at it. Well, I paid into the system, so therefore, I'll get mine when the time comes. But the problem is, what you gonna get is what the people are paying at that time. And if you don't allow those people to earn anything so they can do some paying, there's going to be less for you to get. And, and that's, that's what I'm, what I'm, the point I try to make with lawmakers all the time. Every time we saddle someone with a criminal record, we diminish their ability to be productive and to pay for our future. You need to think about that every time you ruin a life. Is it really worth it for the collective good of society? When you create a Craig's Room ad and you badger someone who has no intention of meeting a minor and you finally convince them to come meet a make-believe minor and then you saddle that person with a sex felony has that really been to the good of society that you wasted that kind of money and you destroyed the ability of that person to be productive because your paw is going to be out at some point and the more people that are putting money in that plate the more money that can go into your paw shouldn't they have thought about that before they went off to try and commit a crime well well, I just the illustration I made made the person wasn't trying to commit a crime, but even if they were trying to commit a crime, I'm getting to the point of your personal interest, not that criminal. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about my paw, what I can get in it. And if I have everybody working for what they earn in Uganda, there's not going to be much to put in my paw. <laughs> and that's what I don't understand what people can't see. So this is really this is you being selfish that you want as much money coming to you because you're 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 approaching I, that age. So you, I <laughs> want I want people earning the maximum of their ability to earn money. This is all about you, isn't it? It's all about the collective good of society, which Americans are have a difficult time uh, uh, contemplating. But we don't need people earning minimum wage. We need people earning the very best that their talent will take them. And, and we've got people listening to this podcast who are dramatically underemployed oh, yeah. because of what they have been convicted of. And of all people, you should relate to this. So, so, so that, that actually gives me a decent opening. Uh, one of our Patreon supporters, he, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure he told you, and I don't know if I shared it with the podcast, but he had received like a one day contracting job. He has some uh, uh, some computer training to, you know, help set up computers and, and troubleshoot them and stuff like that. And he goes and gets hired to do a one day job installing some computers. I'm pretty sure I have the details right, but maybe they're roughly wrong. And they reported back. He did an amazing job. He was on time. He presented well, all that stuff. Then the background check comes back. He will no longer ever be working for this company again. And they are kind of infuriated that they uh, sent this individual on jobs because of his background check. But here he is, he was earning, I think, like 16 bucks an hour, which is, you know, that's over, that's double, uh, more than double minimum wage. He could be doing decent work, but because of his background check, he, uh, he will no longer be doing that work. And is it, is it in our collective interest as a society to have people earning nothing or very minuscule wages who have the capacity to be much greater contributors? Is that in our best interest? And I think the answer is clearly it's not. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't think so. And but, so then, should the people be sitting there saying, "Oh my God, this individual is scary and it makes me feel oogie"? Um, I I just like I always end up. Well, do you want him to die? So how is he supposed to support himself? Oh, okay. So it's okay that he lives home with his parents. His parents are saddled with trying to support him. He can't do anything. He's basically on house arrest. Is that also okay? Oh, he's not in my backyard, so it's all okay as long as I don't have to see it. It's kind of well, like he, a homeless problem in a way. He, he wouldn't feel, he, people wouldn't feel oogie if they didn't know about it. If we didn't broadcast everybody's mistakes to the, to the, to the world, no one would even know. And no one would feel oogie because they would not know. Yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to, like, the, do, you, do you then believe that after a certain number of years that the, the stuff should go away? Should it be as soon as you're done with your sentence, you know, your paper and whatnot? Should that be when it goes away? Well, Can this argument was about this. This argument was about 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 uh, non where there's no conviction. So if we're going to expand to when true, there's true, conviction, true, 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 true. That's sorry. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> sorry, so, I went so, down a whole rabbit trail. <laughs> yeah. So if there has been a conviction at some point, yes, the record should go away. 
I don't know what the magic number is. It may vary from offense to offense. Uh, 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 but but yes, we are forgiving people, or so we say we are. Yeah. We're about second chances, or so we say we are. So why do you want to continue to punish a person after you've punished them and they've paid their debt? Why don't you let go of it and do what you say you believe in and put bygones behind and let that person be a, a reborn citizen? And, and let them start from scratch. If they screw up again, we'll lock them up again. All right. Well, since I took us on a, a massive detour, let's move on because we got to knock these things out to get to our feature segment and our listener questions. Prosecutors can only pass wrongs if only the sister lets, system lets them. And this is from the appeal. Since most prosecutors are trying to root out wrongful convictions or more prosecutors, I'm sorry, more prosecutors are trying to root out wrongful convictions and restore trust in the legal system. But they're meeting opposition on all sides. Why would this? Why would there be opposition on all sides of them rooting out wrongful prosecutions? Well, because the system has many, many barriers built in to preserve convictions. Because the thought is that otherwise, people who are serving prison time, they would perpetually litigate. So, for example, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act that was passed in ninety. I can't keep the year straight, either 94, 96, and it was passed under okay. Newt Gingrich's regime and signed by uh, Bill Clinton. It That took away a lot of tools to challenge those who had been convicted in the state court and had exhausted all their state remedies in terms of going into federal court. Well, the states have also done a lot of tightening up on, in terms of their state post-conviction proceedings in terms of what type of claims are cognizable post-conviction, and, and they really really limit the timelines on when you can file things. And oftentimes, a wrongful conviction is beyond the window of time where they're permitted to, to, to gain relief. It's a structural defect in the system. And this is where judges have to either legislate from the bench and say, well, I'm going to ignore the law, even though the, the person had 24 months or whatever the case may be, to bring their, 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 their allegation or or they have to say, well, I'm going by the law. It's like the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act. You, think, uh, you effectively have one year from denial by the highest tribunal in your state of your claims. And if you don't bring the claim within one year and you have to exhaust, you can't just go directly from, from your conviction to federal habeas. You have to exhaust by going to, or at least attempting review at your state's highest court. If they deny review, then that's sufficient. You've exhausted. But then you have 12 months from that point. To bring a federal claim, and then you have they have they have all these deferential standards where you have to defer to the state court decision unless it's contrary to a U.S. Supreme Court precedent, not a, a court of appeals, not a district court, but a U.S. Supreme Court precedent. So you have all these hoops that you can't jump through. So judges are getting caught in in, in the crosshairs of situations where they'd like to be able to grant relief, but they're 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 not able to. It's like the judge last week that said, "Don't blame me. I didn't put this sentence on you." Well, the yeah. judges. If if they're not allowed to do it, do you want the judge to go rogue? Is that what you're wanting? Right. Do you, <laughs> so, uh, or so do you want a, them? There's another paragraph in there that says, in Philadelphia, Krasner's office has not only exonerated 10 wrongfully convicted people in less than two years, but he's also announced his intent to form a landmark sentence review program that will recommend reductions in draconian prison sentences when the public good is served by earlier release. Nearly two dozen other prosecutors have now expressed interest in creating similar programs. This guy is contagious. He's infectious. And we need to root this out at the source. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, but if you read down a little bit further, they, 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 they talk about uh, uh, a prosecutor's responsibility to, to, and the U.S. Supreme Court said in 1922 in Bailey versus Commonwealth, a prosecutor is to protect the innocent as well as to prosecute the guilty. Well, I think a lot I, of prosecutors. I, I thought that was the intent. Yes. So, but prosecutors don't see it that way. Go out there and run for office and say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you vote for me, I'm going to make sure that I protect the, 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 the accused. And that's going to be my priority to make sure that we do our best to protect the rights of the accused. Tell me how that works out for you. I don't think that, that is nowhere, anywhere near the mindset of what the American people think our criminal justice system is. That right there in a nutshell is a significant challenge. So that's 100 years old, just shy of. And the job of the prosecutors to protect the innocent as well as prosecute the guilty. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that literally does tie over. I was trying to figure out how we we're going to segue over. It says, uh, but from the crime report, can we learn from prosecutor misconduct? 
prosecutor makes misconduct is withholding evidence and uh, just just willfully knowing that this person is at a minimum not as guilty as we say or as we you know people might think to all the way to the point where they're not guilty at all but they still they're trying to notch their belt and put a, a conviction out there like there's so much injustice in that and and we really are we haven't designed a system that holds prosecutors accountable I predict within 20 years, if the trends continue, that we will we will have the machinery in place. But we've always assumed that prosecutors operate from the utmost of moral morality, and they would never do anything like that. And we're just now beginning to see below the surface as as these exonerations become more and more common, and we find out that they were that 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 withheld evidence, manipulated evidence, and just out out fraudulent evidence. I think that one of the articles we had tonight said they paid someone $4,000 for testimony. Was that in the previous yeah. article? Yeah, I believe it was. So, yes, I remember yeah. saying that. So, so yeah, but, but we just haven't had the machinery in place uh, to deal with what, because we assume that people that, that got these jobs had, like Ashley, that they had the utmost of integrity. And, and we're learning now that we were wrong. And so, okay. I, I, I want to give Ashley all of the, the, uh, you know, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, benefit of the doubt that, that she did go in with all of the intent, but then there are potential, like, I mean, if your boss tells you go prosecute this case, what are you supposed to do? Say FYP and not prosecute it, even though your boss tells you to? That would be an extreme remedy. There'd be other things you could do short of FYP that, that, that you could, you could, <laughs> that you could do to wreck the case, but FYP would be a last resort that you could do. And what, and what I don't, uh, go ahead. No, I mean, I mean, does then she like so? Her 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 job performance then suffers, and she gets perhaps fired or not get a promotion because she knows that she's prosecuting an innocent person, but she has to do it. So she does a poor job at prosecuting. That's one option. That, that that's one option. That, yeah, sometimes you you can go into judicial uh, chambers and with the other side and have a conference with the judge, and and the judge can offer suggestions. Of, what would what might would work in terms of if if the case is not very good, what type of motion you might can file. You can there's a number of things you can do. You can miss some deadlines by accident, and, and the case can get dismissed. But FYP is the last resort. Did you decide I, yeah. my ethics won't allow me to do this? And what I'm always perplexed about is in this day of full employment, where people are in short supply. If you did lose your job, would that be the end of all life as we know it? If you're a capable person, would you be confident that someone else would want you with your, with your integrity? Or, it's or, true. Or, 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 or are we a nation where integrity has no value? Uh, you guys got to uh, suck up to the man. That's that's what that ultimately means. Uh, 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 most people that, that have, have amounted to anything in their life have been fired many times, several times. I don't know about many times, but, but people have been fired more than once. Rush Limbaugh tell you he's got, he's got fired. Yes, I've been fired. Everybody's been fired. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it it's not generally the end of all life as we know it. Generally not. You get a little pissed uh, off and, and your your feelings hurt for a little while. Well, it it, it could be very detrimental if you're if you're in a twenty five year retirement track and you're year twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. It it, it 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 would be very frustrating. Uh, but if you believe like you say you do about having to answer in the afterlife for your for your uh, an account for what you've done, I would think that that would weigh into your analysis also about saying, well, I did the right thing. Even faced with a tough choice, I did the right thing. Do you think that the Miranda warning for suspects is important? No, no, they shouldn't even bother with that. I think uh, Kansas City uh, should end written Miranda warnings for suspects. This is from the Associated Press. The Miranda warning is like you have the right to remain silent, all that garbage, right? Yes. Well, they, they're not going to end the warning, just the written the written ones. So uh, as I, like I've seen on TV, like they will, they will sort of tell it to you, but they will also hand it to you for you to be able to read it. And sometimes have you signed it that you understand it, but as long Man, as that's also, that's like signing a, a sentence, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm uh, agreeing to, to um, uh, what's the word? Take a, take a plea deal. Like that's not under duress. You got like the lights flashing in your hand handcuffs and says, are, are you agreeing that you understand your Miranda? Like you don't have to talk to us. And then they're going to say, hey, we would like you to answer to some questions. You're like, um, I guess I'll answer your questions so that I can go home. Oh, so you're waiving your Miranda rights? Yeah. Is that what I'm getting at here? Is that That's what, this what you're is getting, getting at. Towards? Yeah. yeah. It, 
that so many people, it's it, so few people, I should say, so many people just disregard the Miranda warnings and talk. It's the rare, it's the rare person who who invokes Miranda and says, "I'm not going to talk to you people." It it it's unfortunate, but their their skill exceeds the willpower of the average person to say, "No, I'm not going to talk." Haven't I heard that some of the SCOTUS judges think that this is some kabuki stuff here? Like this is this is not a constitutional thing. Have they, I, I, I? Yes, the, the, have I heard the, that. The conservatives on the court have been weakening Miranda for a long time. And uh, uh, so now that you have to continuously invoke it, they can come back later after a period of time. We're not clear on what period of time, but they can come back. And so you have to speak in order to invoke your Miranda right. So Judge, I believe it was Kagan, <laughs> said it, that it, 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 it turns Miranda on, on its head because in order to assert it, you have to continue to speak. So they, they ask you this afternoon, do you want to speak? And then they come back two days from now and say, do you want to speak? You have to, you have to go through the stress of asserting it all over again. I mean, and and nodding your head it doesn't count. I don't know. I guess it would depend on the okay. police. <laughs> I didn't. We were not going to sit on that for very long. But that's uh, I, you, you, you have a constitutionally protected right to an attorney. Is that correct, or do I have that wrong? If you're facing loss of liberty of of, of a certain period, I don't remember if it's three or six months, but yes, you do have the right to an attorney in a criminal proceeding. And, it's going to result in loss of liberty. Right. So you, so they're just telling you what your constitutionally protected rights are. Why would the the justices be pushing against that? I mean, because we don't really have civics training in school to teach you that this is something that you can assert. Well, it it interferes with police investigations. Very simple. Okay, so, so we're just trying to get at convictions. Be damned that the police have hurdles to jump through. That's too inconvenient. Uh, the, the, the whole the whole thing the the whole thing is to make it the system run more efficiently to to churn out convictions. I see. And we're all about trying to reduce some prison population because it's really effing expensive to have a bunch of people in prison too, right? Uh, well, that's a after that's an afterthought that 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 we've come to realize recently. But we don't put two and two together very well in this country. We don't look. <laughs> give you give you an example about uh, uh, just less than ten years ago. Uh, a lawmaker in Arkansas said that, uh, that she wanted to pass, and she succeeded in passing a bill requiring all level three offenders to be on GPS monitoring, and it would only apply to people who got convicted of a level three offense. It was not going to be ex post facto. So she said, it don't matter what it costs, because it's going to be a long time before anybody actually is subject to it. And that'll be for a later date. To, to do the, it's hard to do the fiscal analysis because you have to do the input and figure out how many people are going to be convicted going forward, how long they'll be in prison, when they'll start to come out, how much will GPS cost at that time, how many will come out in year one, year two, year three, what will the cumulative effect be? And we don't think about stuff like that. Yeah, that's too complicated. From, from the Times Union, a former Georgia judge gets prison for trying to entice a teen? Like what is, so this is from just a couple of days ago. This is from the 12th. So this is two days ago. Former judge was sentenced Wednesday to 15 years in prison for having a sexual online relationship with who he believed was a 14 year old girl and trying to entice her into sexual acts. Does this mean it was not actually a 14 year old girl? I suppose so. But I think that's an excessively long sentence for that, for that offense. But- but Georgia, For you just people, talking naughty with what he believed as a fourteen-year-old. You people, well, apparently they they they, they traded. He sent some <laughs> pic, pictures as well, but it's an awful long sentence uh, for for that. He's yeah. also uh, fifty-nine years old, so he's not getting out till he's like seventy-four years old. If I did my math, and don't ever do math while you're recording a podcast. And, seventy-four uh, is off. Like that's up in like your age range almost. And he's not even anywhere close. He's got another. He's got another hundred years to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, served, uh, that's that's just well, because well, we, it, we let the lawmakers set, uh, set this up. The, the cute thing is that, it's, is that he was the uh, general counsel representing the Department of, 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 uh, of Family and Children's Services in Newton and Walton counties, which is just east of Atlanta. Oh. So he so he, he 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 was in a he was in an interesting position. <laughs> oh boy. Um, oh, oh, so, so it says, unknown to Jeffrey, he was actually chatting with the girl's father, who was never, I don't even want to read the rest of that sentence. It's the third paragraph down. Do you want me to read the rest of that? <laughs> he was actually chatting with the girl's father. Do you see that? Pretty, pretty disgusting. Yeah, I don't want to read the rest of that sentence. All right, then. We should then, uh, we should then move on to the Marshall Project. 
So and uh, yeah. you're gonna have what? Go ahead. Yeah, he 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 got a hard sentence regardless. Um, and the the uh, the next article comes from the Marshall Project, and it is: Can we fix mass incarceration without including violent offenders? Larry, your answer is: We cannot. All right, then we should move on. We can, Give me uh, like a thirty second rundown, please. We can bend the trajectory down with 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 not including violent offenders, but this is back to the to to we the people. The people are not ready in most instances to start letting any leniency be shown on those who have been convicted of anything that's labeled a violent offense, regardless of whether there's any violence in the offense or not. So with with the overbroad definition of violent offenders and then they automatically exclude sex offenders. I think in pre-show banter, I said you, you're exceeding probably 50% of the offender population if you do the sex offenders and anything that's, that re- remotely is, is labeled violent. Domestic violence would be an example. I mean, sometimes domestic yeah. violence, there's not that much violence. Anytime you unplug the telephone and kill their access and, and put your foot in the doorway so that they can't leave, that's not good behavior. But that's not necessarily violent either. But it all falls under the gamut of of of, of domestic violence, and 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 uh, if, so if we don't do that, it's it's like trying to balance the budget by putting sixty seventy percent of it off limits, and then trying to balance the budget on the twenty five thirty percent of discretionary spending. We can bend the we can bend the trajectory down, but if we're going to not be the mass incarceration nation, we're going to have to put all offenders on the table for discussion, and not just the people who have been convicted of minor nine violent and, and possession of drug offenses because those are going to go through the system pretty fast and we're still going to have an over incarceration problem interesting um almost done here a police officer shot a fleeing teen it was his second on-duty killing in less than a year this is from the washington post this is uh from california if i'm not mistaken and but this time it's over 15 year old carmen spencer mendez who was fleeing this officer and uh, the body cam footage shows that he um, kind of mowed him down a little bit. I, I was having a conversation with a friend this afternoon. And I mean, if you're like trying to gain entry into a military base or some sort of secure facility like that, perhaps the police, the, those, uh, those enforcement agencies, they would have the authority to, to shoot on, on site. And maybe if there's like a nationwide manhunt that we see in like TV movies where the plane crashes and there's now a hundred uh, felons out running around, perhaps then you like issue a blanket order that you can shoot on contact. But if someone has just like been pulled over for, and this is a 15 year old kid. So this is not even like, it's not, he was in a car. I mean, maybe he was in a car, but you know, he's not anyway. So maybe he gets like he was fighting. Maybe he had some drug possession. Maybe like, and he runs away. And you're gonna shoot him? Doesn't seem like that's a justified shooting. Well, often, oftentimes, what appears to be unjustified is deemed justified by the system. You remember the one crawling backwards in the Vegas hotel uh, footage, footage we we did early on in the podcast. Do you remember mm-hmm. that one? Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. it, it was hard to argue with a guy with just a little skimpy pair of panties on. Yeah, we had on his boxers <laughs> that that he posed any threat when it was clear he had no weapons whatsoever. Uh, so even if he was pulling up his panties, he still wasn't able to do to, to inflict any harm. He, I mean, that was a disgusting episode of police overreach. He was found not culpable. The officer acted rationally, and uh, so so and, yes, this this is this is probably going to be one where they find it justified. And uh, this is uh, didn't California just institute some sort of law? And I want to say that the way the law is uh, worded, it's kind of backwards in the way the way that it appears to me but they have created some sort of higher standard that the police have to follow before they can they, they use did the force they did and i'm not able to articulate that policy but yes they are trying to deal with it uh with and, with, uh, so, with reigning and the police overreach for grabbing for for lethal force and brian was just asking me about this in chat and uh so this death took place in uh two, late 2018 and the one prior to that was uh, also in late 2017 so that's why this one didn't necessarily apply to uh using that policy i was i was kind of curious about that too so thank you for asking that and then that got that cleared up um from over at the chicago tribune wayside cross child sex offender residents received new notices citing proximity to aurora park 
These are some people that are getting uh, notices. They live in a ministry and they were given letters that they have to leave within 30 days because there's a park that has been stood up. I think it says about 500 feet away, if I'm not mistaken. And do you know if this is like one of those things, like a pocket park that just sort of, like, hey, we want these people out. So we're going to put a park up and we'll have to get them to vacate. I'm not sure on that. But what I do know is that our favorite attorneys, Adele Nicholas and Mark Weinberg, are on it. And they are going to, if they haven't already, they're going to file for an injunction and hopefully preserve the, the status quo. But but this is this is just over the top. Is um 30 days, is that kind of quick for them to try and get an injunction? Well, they did it less than that in Tennessee when the when they were going to okay. split up the families. So yes, it is it is a short time frame, but but they're good and I and I think they'll pull it off because they've litigated this issue before, and they decided right. not to enforce it, and then they're right back at it again because the city council said we're we're not going to put up with this nonsense. Okay, so it's nineteen pe- nineteen residents that were scheduled to receive the letters on Friday morning at seven thirty. Tell me what the justification is. Can can you do me a favor and argue the other side for a minute and just help me understand their position? It's hard to argue something <laughs> as insane as that. I generally can. I hear crickets, uh, man. I hear yeah, crickets. <laughs> I, I generally can, but but because this goes against everything about morality, you know, people are, people that would would deprive someone of housing deliberately when they're already they're already on the fringes of society. Yeah, I mean they're living in like a uh, I don't want to call it a halfway house, but they're living in a you know in a Christian home that probably is just like giving them some sort of temporary ish housing until they can get themselves stood up on their own. I'm assuming yeah. that's what this is. Yeah, I, I I wish I could explain, but I can't. But but the 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 uh, system is at work. The lawyers are on it, and and I I I think that they will probably have a good chance of success. This team is very good. Okay. Yeah. And this is essentially like a NIMBY kind of thing, not in my backyard. We just don't want those people living here. I don't care where they live, but not here. That's right. Yeah. We can't have that. Thanks for stuff. being thanks for being compassionate Americans. Yay. <laughs> uh, and our final final article is from the Center Daily News. And I should say Sentry because it says S C E N T R E. Um, this is Nebraska inmate seeks to overturn prison's pornography ban. This guy is a life sentence and he wants to have the naughty books in prison. And he says that it is discriminatory because, and I like his thinking here. So if a, um, if a gay guy has a, a muscle magazine and you've got men wearing very, very skimpy, skimpy tights on, he could be having uh, some level of arousal by looking at the uh, bodybuilder dudes and, and he wants some uh, nudie magazines in. Well, you have to admit that that's a creative argument. You have to admit that, don't you? Uh, I think that that seems like a legit argument to me. If if you uh, what is they 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 still publish Maxim? Yes, as far well, I don't know. Let's uh, I guess I can look that so up. Many, quick. So Give many magazines, on the so, so many magazines have gone by the wayside. But oh yeah, but it if, totally if, is. It's still a thing. Yeah, but but that would be, I mean, like like all the men's fitness magazines where they where they where they they go shirtless and have the little tight spandex shorts and stuff. Uh-huh. Huh? I don't yep. see I don't see anything illogical about that. It's looking as a maxim where they're wearing the beat or like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Do they still publish Correct. that? Uh, I, they still do, but you will have a hard time getting that one in prison. They will they will at least here they will. I don't well, know. Well, that's what I'm know, saying. So more... so but but I doubt they're denying uh, men's fitness and men's health and those type of magazines. So I mean, you have to give it give him credit. He did come up with a novel argument. <laughs> I like it. I, I personally like I does 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 society then do these men and and other and women do they end up devolving down to the lowest forms of society by having access to the nudie mags? That's uh I guess that's a, a way to word all that. The man's never you know if he has a life sentence he is ostensibly never going to be with a woman again. So why not let the guy fantasize all he wants and take care of business? Well, I think it's in our evolving standards of indecent indecency. That I mean. Uh, as far as back 20, 30 years ago, I don't think most prison administrators even gave a second thought to having having uh, uh, stimuli around like this. I mean, they didn't let Hustler and and some of the some of the more hardcore magazines, but 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 just regular ordinary penthouse playboys, but especially there was no thought about it. But there has been a change in our attitudes because it is now if you have, for example. When you have a fully integrated correctional staff, like we do in prisons, and you have a centerfold poster, and the the officer who 
happens to be looking at that feels that that's degrading and humiliating when, I, when I'm doing my job and I have to look at that disgusting nudity on your wall. And I'm here trying yes. to do a job. So so you get a lot of pushback from the staff that they don't want that. And and then I think that, that the that the 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 prison administrators have become less committed to protecting people's rights to read and see things because clearly in prison you don't have the right to, to read and see everything. They 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 do have a level of control and they've just pushed the limits to see how far they can take this and this this is some pushback to see where the limits are. We'll find out. We'll be talking about this on a few future episode as this case plays out. Yeah, definitely. My All prediction right, Larry, my prediction let's... my prediction is it'll be dismissed. <laughs> and so dude will not be able to get his mags in? He probably will not be. The courts are they don't find anything very shocking these days and and they're very unsympathetic to prisoners. The Prison Litigation Reform Act made it much more difficult to, to litigate against prisons and I, I just I just don't see it as being I hope I'm wrong, though. I always like being wrong on stuff, but I predict that he won't get that much traction on this. Certainly. All right, then. Um, So let's have a little discussion about people that are just on the registry. So you've done your sentence, you're off of paper, and you just have to go visit your your local sheriff or whatever that term is for your local jurisdiction every year or whatever interval that is, versus being under some kind of supervision, whether that's parole or probation, and your handlers come visit you every now and then, and you have... uh, so anyway, so before I try, and I, I don't want to spill the beans too soon. So let's have a discussion about what the, dis- the difference is in those two uh, situations. Well, as Mr. Reagan said, well, you remember that? He would start I do. Every, a- well. every answer with well. <laughs> well. There is, there, is, we- there is a dramatic difference. Now, before I get any hate mail, the registry is not. I'm not saying the registry doesn't have many debilitating punitive aspects of it, but supervision is far different than mere registry. And we can start going into some of the differences, but it's not the same. And and me personally, I can only speak from the position of Georgia and being, you know, having my handlers come out because I'm, I'm still on paper for, for a good number of years to re- to remain. But for me, they come out and visit me a couple times a month. And I have a curfew that I have to abide by. When I do go out of state, I have to get uh, permission to do so. Uh, offhand, those are the specific things that impact my life directly. And that's not the same situation for all counties. I know that some friends of mine that live up in the northeast side of the state, they don't have a curfew. Some people that are like right in the Atlanta proper area, they don't have curfews. But maybe it would be harder for them to travel depending on what their, uh, their handlers, you know, what their caseload is. So well, that that's that's a good beginning of the of the differences. When you're on supervision, you're within a zone of revocation of that supervision. When you're registering, you're you're not within a zone of revocation. You're within a zone of being charged with a new crime of failure to comply. But when you're on supervision, that supervision can be revoked. So the revocation standards are less than the proof that it takes to, to convict you of a new crime of failure to comply with registration. So that's difference number one. It takes proof beyond a reasonable doubt to convict a person of, of, of violation of terms of the registry. So you've got a much higher standard of proof required. When you're merely on registration, they cannot, and I know they do it, but they cannot lawfully come into your home and do a search. In most places around the country, you waive your your right to privacy and to have your you you'll consent to either a very low level standard of of search or just upon demand of search of your person, your dwelling, your vehicle, or or, or even your your legal your uh, electronic apparatuses. Registering does not carry that that requirement. You do not have to consent to any searches of your person your place, your vehicle, or your electronic devices. Now, I'm going to start getting hate mail now because people are going to say, well, I have to, as a condition of, of registering, I have to give my email address and I have to give my screen names. And I think even in some cases, they actually have to give their passwords. And I'm hoping those have been challenged or in the process. Or, 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 but but those are, the, those are the, the rarity, not the norm. When you're on probation, they can impose conditions upon you to get counseling. 
So the probation officer can give you a curfew. The registry officer cannot. The probation officer can give you a condition that you take a urine test. The registry officer cannot. The probation officer can require you to have a travel permit. The registry officer cannot require you to have a travel permit, but in some cases they can require you to give advance notice. But it's not the same unless you live in Alabama. There's always the outlier exception of Alabama where you have to get a <laughs> permit to leave. I think it's even the county, but certainly the state of Alabama, but I think it's even the county that you have to leave. So Alabama's the outlier, and, and their registry is on appeal now in the 11th Circuit. But you, you, can't, you can't be compelled when you're on the registry. As a general rule, they cannot prohibit you from having relationships. Again, there are exceptions. Tennessee had the law. Alabama has the law. And Tennessee is in an in, 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 in injunctive status now that they can't pr- prohibit you from having minors living with you. But as a general rule, there are a lot of differences between registration and, 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 and supervision. But what people, what, what consternates people is because registration has become, if you look back probation 20 years ago, how lax probation was just a couple of decades ago, if someone had a conviction 20 years ago and they, and they, they've been off paper for a very long time, and as the registry has totally encroached, they find the registry to impose more conditions on them than they had on supervision. They might have been on supervision where they mailed in a monthly report once a month. And they only saw the probation officer if the probation officer had a need to see them. And they mm-hmm. say, well, hell, I only had to mail in a report once a month. And as long as I provided proof I was working, I only went to see them once a quarter in person. And now I have to see, I have to go see the registry officer as often or more often than I saw my PO back 20 years ago. That is correct. But that still doesn't make the registry the same as probation. Because the, right. the registry can't revoke you. They can prosecute you, but they can't revoke you. And, and, and I was going to bring up another example of, and I know it's not really the case anymore because it's been challenged and won, but Packingham where they said that you couldn't be on social media. And these, this is even after post-sentence. And I, and I know the situation is different now, but that's what it was just a handful of years ago. That is, that is correct. And, and the, so there, there, there are a lot of differences. I'm not defending the supervision systems in terms of what they're requiring of people. I'm not defending the registry systems in terms of what they're requiring people. They're both over the top. They're both way over the top. But anybody who says that that registration is the same as supervision, it's just flat out not true. <laughs> it's just flat out not true. But but registration is very punitive in many states. And I'd say even in the majority of the states, it's very punitive and very debilitating. An example of uh, something that someone under supervision may have to do is to keep a driving log. All the places that they, you know, to and from and keep the mileage to make sure that you didn't go visit any uh, places where children are known to congregate while you were moving about. Um, Another one, excuse me, would be that you couldn't uh, go to places where children are known to congregate as well. Like you, like, which could be freaking Walmart. Not to say like the obvious example would be like McDonald's has a has a playground in it, you know. I I think that makes sense to uh, maybe avoid those places as much as possible, but you can't really avoid Walmart. I mean, you could, but just do everything on Amazon. Oh, I forgot you're not allowed on the internet. Really... You're not allowed on the internet. Right? Oops. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. How are you supposed to How are you supposed to function in that world? And Larry, I always wonder about that one, and I don't want to go too far down that rabbit trail. But there's so much television slash entertainment stuff that is only like is available through the internet. Let's just say Netflix as an example, you have to have an internet enabled some TV somehow to be able to do that. And I'm like, what's the harm in having Netflix? Are they going to give a crap about you having Netflix? And the answer may be yes. That's crazy. So, well, just be clear that some registration uh, statutes do have proximity restrictions where a person can be prosecuted. But again, even there, they have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt when you're having rep- supervision revocation. The standard is usually just by preponderance, slightly moving the needle because you're already convicted and you're still serving that sentence from the previous conviction. So therefore, what it takes to sustain a violation of supervision is far less than what it takes to sustain a brand new criminal charge. 
and the rules of evidence and admissibility of evidence, all that's different in a revocation proceeding. In particular, if it's a parole revocation hearing, you even have less rights because that's generally administrative versus judicial for probation. And that would be having pornography. In my state, you can't have porn. Uh, and then maybe like drinking or something like that, something that's actually legal, but by yes. your probation conditions is not legal. That would be that would be an example of, of other differences in the registry. There's no registry law. And then we're going to get an email from Pennsylvania or Texas where they have civil commitment. They're going to say, Larry, but if you had any idea what you were talking about, you would know <laughs> that here in Pennsylvania, that if you're a sexually violent predator, that you have to do, they can compel you to get treatment as a condition. Yes, I actually do know that. But again, that's an outlying situation. That's not the norm. You have to have that. The, the, there's a judicial due process to be, be, be labeled. SVP, however flawed it may be, and you have to go through that process, and that is how they impose those conditions on you. So there is some sort of due process process to get you in those conditions? In, in, in Pennsylvania, for sure. I'm not sure how they do the SVP in Texas, but in Pennsylvania, it's a, it's a process. They, 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 they file a petition to declare you a sexually violent predator, and you have the right to some due process. It's not just by the, by the crime you're convicted of. And, and those and, people, those people can be required to do things that, that that others are not, that are just simply registering. And then, even to further uh, delineate the differences, the difference between parole and probation is pretty extreme too. I, I like to personally think of parole, and I, and I've heard different states have different terms for this, and you could probably clarify. But in my mind, parole is like you're still in prison, but not inside the walls. And probation is, you know, it's like you've gotten a new job and they can quote unquote, like fire you without really a whole lot of reason to fire you. It's, I don't know if that it helps to, to make a distinction between the two. Well, parole is, as it was historically, uh, was, was a person getting early release from their prison sentence and not serving all their time behind the walls. As parole has evolved, like in Illinois and New Mexico, they, they call it parole in New Mexico. In Illinois, they call it MSR, mandatory supervised release. People, you serve all your time in prison, and then they release you under the control of the parole board. And in the case of Illinois, it's the, uh, it's the prison review board. But in our case, it's the parole board, and they call it a period of parole. But in, in the literal sense of traditional parole, it would be an early release from prison. So therefore, since you're still serving your prison sentence, you had a far less expectation because you were conditionally released from prison to begin with. So therefore, it, it was designed to encourage administrators to give people early release, and therefore, they didn't want to make it too difficult to revoke that conditional release because if you make it too difficult, nobody would ever take a chance to release somebody. But on probation, and that's been a deliberately granted to you as an alternative to prison, and in some cases, it's a split sentence where they stacked prison and then followed by probation. But in many cases, it's an alternative to prison. So therefore, the, 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 the expectation was that it was serving as an opportunity for rehabilitation and, and therefore due process. You're about to lose your liberty. So there's a lot of due process and a probation revocation, but not as much as there would be in the guilt or innocent phase of a brand new charge because you already are convicted while you're on probation. You are a convicted person. At that point, even if they haven't entered the judgment, if you're on some type of deferred status, you've already acknowledged your guilt to be on the deferred status. So you don't know what else are we missing about the differences between the two. You no longer have the presumption of innocence. Well, I think we've, unless there's any chat questions, I think we've pretty well cleared it up. It's, it's, there are vast differences. But again, registering is very debilitating. There are a lot of excesses in registration requirements, but you can't say it's the same as probation because it isn't. Let me let me toss this one at you. It from from what I would envision of coming down the pike when I end up off paper and only have to quote unquote worry about registration. Going up and visiting the man and doing the fingerprints and all that, yes, intimidating, debilitating and all that, humiliating. But I would still say that the internet piece is the debilitating part. What particular piece are you referring to? The, the internet piece of just having my junk flying out there oh, all over the internet. Yes, telling, yes, telling yes. That's, the, that's very debilitating. If you, if you had um, the same requirements without your publication, you would mind, you would uh, very, have a little objection to going to the sheriff's office once a year. Mm-hmm. All right, then. 
So if anybody has any questions or you want to throw out comments, then, uh, you know, we, you can reach us at registry matters cast at gmail.com, or you can call it seven, four, seven, two, two, seven, four, four, seven, seven. Feel free, lay it on and tell Larry he's full of poop and doesn't know anything that he's talking about though. Larry, I would totally stand up and defend you that you are the only person that knows all this crap. Well, not the only, there's one more. Uh, who else? Brenda? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Larry, I picked up something off of Reddit that I wanted to, uh, to throw your way because this is incredibly disturbing to me. And I thought we would just bat this around for a minute. Uh, it says, my son is only 14. He'll be 15 in January. Over the weekend, he's admitted to some horrible things. I did what I thought was the right thing to do. We went to the police station to turn himself in. That was on Saturday. I'm shocked, scared, and feel so much guilt. There are so many thing, terrifying things that can happen to my son, to my family. The officer that I spoke with said I could take him home that evening. He also said that investigators would be calling me this week and that Child Protective Services was notified of the situation. I am so unsure of the best way to support my son during this time. I think I should get a lawyer for him, but I'm not even sure how to go about doing so. I don't know what I should be doing to help him get the help that he needs. If anyone out there knows anything about Texas law or have any advice as to what I should do to help him, I'd appreciate any advice given. First of all, don't bring your kid to the police station and turn him in. For Pete's sake, you could go, you go to a lawyer. You could go to some kind of treatment provider and start trying to get counseling right off the bat. This was a horrible idea. Well, I would uh, take the issue with the second thing on the treatment provider. If he's already broken the law in most states, they would have a duty to report that. So you would you'd oh, be in okay. the, you'd, fair, you'd, fair, fair. you'd be in the same situation. Uh, you'd be in a mandatory report, huh? You'd be likely in a mandatory reporting situation. Uh, now, if you haven't broken the law yet, and this is going down a rabbit hole because people people say I should be able to go get help. You can get help before you break the law. If you you, think can't it, you go get help if you don't if you don't be specific about who the 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 victim was? Uh, you can, uh, but with enough clues because they're going to report whatever you yeah. tell them. With enough clues, yeah. it, if well, if you give them enough with with the report that they filed, the police may be able to piece together what 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 what's happened. But before you act, you can get treatment. But I, I think at this point that that the machinery is probably unstoppable. Uh, a lawyer would be a good thing to do. Uh, a, a 15-year-old in Texas can be prosecuted as an adult and easily convicted as an adult. I think it's just a matter of the prosecutor saying that's what we're going to do. In my state, it would be very, very hard to to prosecute that 15-year-old as an adult. It'd be 15 before the before their machinery gets in gear. Uh, it'd be very hard to do anything with him other than put him in the juvenile system, which would would be would be very minor in terms of what the system would do because he's he's in no case can be held beyond his 21st birthday no matter what he's done yeah. and those of you that are tired of me hearing about this cody Posey is an example of that all he did was kill his father and his mother and his sister and hey man that's all that's all no big deal what's the and, problem with that and and he walked free on his 21st birthday because he the state could not not beat the burden of showing he was not amenable to treatment and that's the burden for putting a person in adult court here and uh, so, so this this kid had had he chosen to have been born in New Mexico, he would have a much he would <laughs> he would chosen have a, to have that ovarian <laughs> lottery again. He'd have a lot different potential consequences facing him. But he since he chose Texas, it's it's very scary to me too. And I just sure wish that that what people would think about is going to the police with a serious crime. With a confession, it's just not generally wise. You go to an attorney if you if you feel the need to talk about something like that, and the attorney can figure out and advise the strategy of whether or not to go to the police. And if it's something that's going to surface anyway, it may be wise for the attorney to go to the police, go to the prosecution, and try to cut a deal. Right. Uh, if, if it's something that's not going to surface anyway, then I leave that to the legal professional that's licensed in your state to advise you. But Going to the police is not generally wise, and I would encourage anybody who's thinking about going to the police, don't. That's a, that is literally the thing that I wanted to talk about was the idea that mom had and the mindset behind uh, mom to like, hey, they're there to help us. I really, that's where I was trying to go on with this. Uh, well, that's exactly what she would segment. have thought. I mean, you, you, you grow up being, that being drilled into you, the, 
when you were growing up in my era, they always tell you if you have any problem at all, you can always approach a police officer. So this, is, in mom's mind, was a problem, and the person to approach was a police officer. I mean, I, I can't say that the thinking is completely illogical. But no, I'm with you on that. And it, but, and it probably should be the mindset that, we, that they are there to help us, but I don't think that we are there anymore. I don't think so. Um, I just want to touch on one little, one little like concept and it was, uh, submitted by a person named tech addict. And, uh, he said, he sent me a Wikipedia article. It's called confabulation. And the general definition of it is just to have a conversation about, excuse me, I wanted to have a conversation about being inaccurate without the intent to deceive, which is what confabulation means. Because we talk about people doing false confessions and so forth. Like they have no intent to be deceitful necessarily. Not false confessions, excuse me, false accusations. Maybe that they don't have the intent to deceive. They're just uh, inaccurate in their thinking. Mm, I can buy into that. I I think that uh, from my personal experience with my family, I think that people uh, have, in my situation, told me things that I know just didn't happen the way they said it happened. And in their mind, it's as crystal clear as in my mind is is it, it didn't happen the way they're saying it happened. You know, they, yep. They have exactly. a total total recollection of of when we were put in foster care, exactly what happened on that day in 1966. And I said, well, actually, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> you, yeah. You've you've invented what happened because that's not what the way it went down. And mm-hmm. and uh, so so uh, so I, and I don't think they have any intent at all. I think I think that probably through a combination of life experience and being around people who have told stories that were horrible. That they've adopted a little bit of the stories and blended it into to the recollection, but but I tell you know that's not what happened that on that day. I'm sorry, my recollection is pretty accurate as far as I'm concerned, and and you you recollect something that just did not happen. And lastly, we received a question that came in through Discord, and uh, to just summarize the whole thing, it says um, something about a cert of relief from the judge at the original sentencing in New York. And uh, did you want to just provide a, a quick short little? answer on that the answer was i truly don't know what what the benefits of that would be uh, so I, I wish i could help but i don't know well all right then larry as always you are the bestest 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 co-host in the world you know all the things and i can't thank you enough for joining well how do people how do people listen to this podcast if they want it if they want to hear it well, we, uh, we usually record the show live on Saturday nights at 7 o'clock Eastern. There's a Discord server, and if you go check out the show notes, you can uh, get in there and sign up and listen to us live. But if you can't listen live, this is the most important thing. You can always do it on demand, which is the whole point anyway, to listen to it on demand on your schedule when you want to do it. We want to make this uh, available to you at your convenience. If you would do me a favor and subscribe, you can do this in your favorite podcast app, like on Apple or Google or Stitcher, Slacker, po- Slacker or po- uh, Pocket Cast, Overcast, whatever. Even YouTube, I have a channel out there, release these things, and we get, I don't know, we get a pretty good number of people listening to it from there too. Uh, and by doing it with a podcast app, it will show up on your device the day, like minutes, hours after I release it. So you will have it on your drive for your morning commute on Tuesday mornings. And it also send a signal to these apps that, Hey, this is a podcast that I like, and it will help other people find it. So the more the people, website is, the more people who, go. who sign up to receive this on their app, because like I say, you're talking, you're talking, uh, if, if I wasn't recording, I would have no clue what you're talking about. Podcast app. I say, I what, what is a podcast app? Uh, just I've just recently would, I've just recently in the last year and a half started downloading apps onto my phone. So, uh, so, <laughs> so a person. Well, a I per, do. So I when, do. when they when they sign up, is is there something magical about each time a person receives a a, a, a notification from a podcast? Does that make us grow because other people are, are receiving this and it makes us look better? It make, makes an association that if a person listens to these different podcast so they maybe they listen to other criminal justice reform apps so then the app learns that you like those kind of podcasts and then it may suggest other ones to you and this might be one of those that it suggests that they listen to i see so and a podcast app is is a simple think of it kind of like a web browser that you know you load a web browser and then you go to web pages but a podcast app 
you subscribe to, not a fee subscribe, but you're telling it that you want to receive these. And then it goes out on a periodic basis, whether that's every hour, every several times a day, and checks to see if there's a new episode and automatically pulls the episode down into your device. And then it's just on your phone. And then while you're cleaning, you have some headphones on, you're in the car, you press play and you listen to the podcast uh, to and from work. Well, that's awesome. I think it's the best. I have like 60 subscriptions to different shows. Politics, religion, technology, uh, some entertainment ones. And I'm just constantly all the time listening to podcasts. Well, so I, not- I noticed on our on our YouTube channel, we have, we're have we approaching 200 subscribers, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, we are. That's very yeah. true. Yeah, so uh, that that's fantastic. But but I want to be at 1,000 by the end of the year. Uh, dude, we have like, what? Uh, we have about 17 days till the end of the year? Yeah, we, right. need, we need to grow you, fast. You people get busy. Yes, everyone bring in two new subscribers. I agree. Th- that still won't get us there. And uh, probably not. So everybody, uh, you know, you can visit us at registrymatters.co. And from there, you can find the show notes and you can find all the links to all of the things. And with that, we're going to shut this mother down. Good, good night, Andy. Take care, Larry.